الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى أهل الصحابة الأجمعين. So um, if we go back uh, in the last uh, uh, the last portion, he was talking about uh, how life has been given to us and it's a favor and it's a blessing, but it's a responsibility that we will be accounted for. Then he reminds us that in life, <clears throat> he's giving us countless favors and blessings that we are all soaking up. So now and today, he's going to talk about the concept of khilafa or the khalifa. And in the modern context, we have a lot of people who have this strange idea. And it did not help that ISIS and these things came about because um, they're just basically confirming what some of these orientalists are suggesting. That... Uh, the idea of a caliphate is where uh, Muslims are trying to take over the world and have some theological domination over the world and control everybody's uh, you know, resources and realities and force religion on them and all of these things. And that's obviously false as we'll see today what the idea is, is about. Uh, so we're going to address the propensity for human evil and corruption, uh, the power of knowledge and that being our distinguishing trait and addressing our real enemy. Because a lot of people think this and that is the enemy, and behind that is the real enemy, and if we are addressing the real enemy, then uh, we will win the battle. So the beginning is, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفًا Remember when your Lord said to the angels, I am appointing a viceroy on earth. <clears throat> now, can we remember the, the Lord saying that to the angels? No, we weren't there. But what he's telling you is, I'm going to bring you there because it's very important. When he says, what if, it's about something important from the past that needs to be remembered. When he says, either, it's something that's going to happen that's very important for you to be concerned about and ready for. So he says that at one point, the Lord, uh, Rabbul Alameen, so in Arabic when we say, Rabbuka, your Lord. Lord here is basically combining creator, provider, maintainer, and sustainer. These characteristics amongst the many divine qualities and attributes. So when he told the angels, I'm appointing a viceroy on earth. What does this mean? It means one that will, once that being or that entity is put on earth, they will assume authority over the earth and they will have generations who will pass down this authority. So we are to remain on this planet generation after generation. Our purpose is to take care of the earth and consciously rule it by the truth of divine law. What does that mean? That means the human beings will be the stewards or the ambassadors of God to the earth. So we are all consciously, creatively involved in this earth's reality. And we will either bring goodness on the earth, islah, or we will bring ifsad, corruption. And so the angels were concerned because they know, as we'll see, that there will be bloodshed and corruption. So, it's the famous uh, Ya Dawood, the famous ayah in Surah Al, uh, I believe it's Naman or Sad, where it says, Oh David, we have made you a viceroy on the earth, so judge between people with truth and don't follow worldly desires. So, this is telling you the element that should be representative of a Khalifa. In English, we have words for this. So, the Arabic word Khilafa the process of leadership being handed down is caliphate. And Khalifa is the one who is responsible for that. We call it a caliph. caliph. So these are words that have been indoctrinated into the English language because Kha is not available. And so this is, it's important for Muslims to uh, develop their terminological system. You can say, well, the Orientalists, the, the people who are not Muslim have come up with these names and we have these great Arabic terms. This type of attitude is swaying the point 
from its original focus, which is we are callers to a message. The easiest way to communicate that is called wisdom. If there's a way that will be taken in and understood easier than another way, then that. N number two, our religion is universal. Our religion is not a culture. It is not from the earth. It is a heavenly reality that transcends and permeates all of the people on the earth as well as the heavens. So it's not like an Arab religion, right? So we have to learn these terms. So, uh, as we saw, David was speaking Hebrew. He was from a Hebrew context. Believe it or not, people who love David and put the star on the flag, you know, the star of David, this is on the flag of Israel, okay? Uh, they're saying that Hebrew is the language of heaven, and it's the language of Adam and Eve, and that is the supreme, holy, divine language. Sound familiar? Yeah. It's the problem of people, man. They want it to be a cultural thing. Shirk is always about bringing God down to the earth. It's always about relating divine to something we know and we relate to and we can understand in our context, rather than keeping Him above and beyond. So, David was being told that if you want to properly be a ruler of anyone, you have to judge with truth and justice. Meaning what? Even if it's against your own self. The, the Qur'an has all these ayahs about how that is. And as we've said before, one of those ayahs was picked to be at the entrance of the Harvard Law School. Famous ayah from Surah al -Nizam. So the Qur'an is very clear about blind justice. If it's, when the Prophet Wasallam, they questioned him, he said, If Fatima, my beloved daughter, radiyallahu anha, were to steal... I will have her hand taken. Because there is no, you know, preference. Whatever is justice, whatever is truth, will be said no matter what people uh, feel they have connections with whoever. Because the connection is to God, first and foremost. So there are many verses that emphasize that, سَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي he has subjugated to you everything in the heavens and the earth. For what reason? To make you rich and powerful? No. You are responsible of... So what we will come to know, and we'll see in the next verse, it should be taken with the trust of where did you get that knowledge from. If you realize where you got the knowledge from, and what is his qualities and traits then you would deal with that property or that blessing or that favor or that authority the way He would. So how He has dealt with you, you must deal with others. So that is something that is emphasized here. And we're going to see from Surah Quran. Ar-Rahman comes here. We can go ahead and make the point here because I don't think I put it in the notes. <coughs> so, Surah Ar Rahman. Ar Rahman, the essence of God, is a compassionate, merciful, kind, loving, gentle one. What is most important about Him related to you? Allah al Quran. He has taught the Quran. This is the most important knowledge the knowledge of divine will. The knowledge of spiritual enlightenment versus ignorance. Khalaq al insan. The human being's value is not of worth unless it's connected to the spiritual. What makes the human being separate? Allamahu al bayan. He has taught the human being sophisticated means of communication and expression. So then he says, As shamsu al qamaru bi husban. What's the relationship between this and what was said before? The sun and this is not up there. So you're like, where is this? I thought I had put it on there. But the sun and the moon are on set system functionality. He has given it a specific role and it's so if you look scientifically from physics, from mathematics, from astronomy, the sun and uh, the moon have a very distinct role and purpose that they are following to a T. It is amazing. It is faith increasing knowledge when you see how they're functioning. 
وَالنَّجْمُ وَالشَّجَرُ yesterday. What is that saying? These great things you see in the sky, these beautiful lamps, all over. They didn't know what that was back then. وَالشَّجَرُ All these trees all over the place. They are in submission to the will of their Lord. The things that are most apparent in the day and the night to you, throughout, are all in submission to His will. Now look at the next ayah. وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا وَوَضَعَ الْمِيزَانِ He has made this sky uh, with a set system. أَلَّا تَطَغُوا فِي الْمِيزَانِ You have a system too. Do not transgress the limits that he has set. وَأَقِيمُ الْوَزْنَ بِالْقِسْطُ وَلَا تُخْسِرُ الْمِيزَانِ So establish proper dealing and proper rule and do not ruin or lose the system of scales. This is a big metaphor about the human being being consciously responsible about the system of the earth and how it should be taken care of. That's all that is. So what we're being told here in this ayah is that. So, the angels, قَالُوا أَتَجَعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الْدِّمَاءَ وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ they said, will you appoint a people who spread corruption and bloodshed while we are glorifying your praises and sanctifying you? قَالَ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُ He said, I know what you do not know. Now you will find in many... Uh, sto- How many of you ever heard of a story that there were jinns and angels battling it out on the earth before and there was fighting and then they took them down to the ocean and did all this? There's absolutely no reliability to these claims. Makes for a good Hollywood story, depiction. <laughs> but it doesn't make any sense because jinns don't have blood. Blood is something we see. If jinns had blood, we'd see it. They do not have blood. What they're referring to, according to the strong tufts here, that makes sense that many great scholars from the early generations have said, that the angels knew the future. They are, they're privy to the qadr. They're privy to the future that has been given to them about what will happen with these people. So the angels are like, look at all the killing and corruption and evil they'll be doing. Look at all the terrible things these people will do. So they're asking, why are you making this person in charge? We don't understand. So angels can think with some sort of logic but they don't have creative, deep, analytical way of looking at them. They just do by command, and sometimes as you see here, they may ask, um, I'm trying to understand this. So the whole reality of divine law is to protect us from corruption and enmity, and fighting and abuse, and corruption in general for the earth and everything around it. Right now, the earth is in a state where we are in complete failure, Muslim and non-Muslim, to these concepts that we're talking about right here. Whether it be how wealth is taken care of and who has it, whether it be about the environment and how we treat it, whether it be about how laws are established, what about wars, what are about um, human rights and understanding poverty and dealing with it and people with wealth and how they take that in in mind and consideration. Well, there's all kinds of absolute total disgrace. You will see all of the terrible corruption and problems in the world in the sea and in the land because of what people have done. So we are meant to study the revelation and the effects of our actions and, and be intent on getting it right. So, how could we know what is right? Here's where the conundrum comes in. The modern world is telling you, well, what people are inclining to is very evolved thought. We're evolved now. And so this idea of being evolved people is this idea of the way we think nowadays, particularly in America or in Europe, is the educated way of thinking. 
So we're going to now challenge things in the revelation because we have decided that we're more enlightened than that. Or we've decided as people who are not scholars of this revelation that we can rationalize it for ourselves about what we should say about it, how we should deal with it. <clears throat> Here's the problem. Even today in the world, there's fluctuation. I'll give you a good example of this whole thing about evolution and all that. And I'm no scientist, so I don't know. But what I do know is, uh, and I'm not here to say that God is taking a specific stand in the Qur'an as to the nature of the scientific history of mankind and all that. He's not. A lot of Muslims go around saying, if you believe this, and they're talking about science. I had a sister one time ask me, do we believe in dinosaurs? Like sister, it's not a matter of belief. We have all the bones and stuff, they were, they were dinosaurs. Well, why isn't it mentioned in the Qur'an? Qur'an is not a history book or a book of science. It's related to human reality as an entity that was chosen and we are responsible for our souls, so he's guiding us. That's the book of guidance. So with this whole thing uh, about the history of mankind, so we have the common ancestor with the apes, and this is what we know in science. There was a time in which everybody was modern, and the agreed upon knowledge, which was based on a theory, but they were agreed that the earth was flat. Not only that, the universe is geocentric. Everything revolves around the earth in the whole universe. That was in Europe, in many places all over the world, they were the most intellectual people. Now in that time, if you were to say, you know, what do you think about, you know, where we're at scientifically, oh, we are the most advanced. There are, in every society, there always have been people who know more than others. We're trying to brainwash ourselves that where we're at now is pinnacle. But if you talk to a, science in the, a scientist in the field of science, he will admit to you readily, readily he will admit to you, that we're still uncovering stuff every day. We have ideas. You know, like, for example, Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, there's a big bang. Now they're starting to challenge the big bang some more. There's infinite bubble universes that pop up here and there, and it's something that is infinite. Where did you get that from? Well, there's these new theories in science, that, you know, so that's what we're saying now. So, people are fluctuating and they always will be. Our knowledge will always be growing and changing and we'll come up with new conclusions that is the reality. Like, for example, there was a strong thing that they used to have in evolution, that everything was just some algaes and amoebas in the ocean and then it all came out. Now, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I'm watching his The Cosmos, which is a very scientifically enlightening and amazing series to watch. But then whenever he was talking about life on Earth, he says, we don't really know exactly how life came to... We know evolution happened, but how did it all start, we don't really know. He's admitting that. But then if you ask the same guy, because he mentioned in the same series, people think that they must believe in a God to prove all of these things, when we have science to explain things. So we should just take the route of science and try to figure that out as much as we can. And this God stuff is hearsay, and so we don't know agnosticism is the standard we should take. Who are you? Why are you so humble? Whenever it comes to science, we're still learning and uncovering and coming up with... When it comes to religion, for sure that's wrong and false because I didn't see it. You prove to me, and then I'll believe it. Look in your soul, look around you. What about prophets who did miracles? Oh, we didn't see that. Well, there's so many millions and millions upon millions of people who narrated all that stuff. Why would you go along with something if you didn't see it? And if somebody told you, yeah, I saw this, and you see them living a lifestyle that reflects that they saw this, you believe them. If they're not, then you won't believe them. So the point here is that revelation is the means by which we will know. And so uh, that's where the importance of knowledge comes in. Qalu atajalu fiha that was added to this. They said, oh, so angels are what? What are angels? They are servants of God made of light. They are naturally by, like, like any other creation, they are glorifying and praising God. And they have amazing abilities. But they're not wise beings. They're not creative intellectual beings. They don't understand conceptually why things are the way they are. They don't get that. So he's clarifying to them the point. That you don't know what you're talking about, and I do. And then they are realizing this. So what is the value of praising him without choice based on knowledge? 
So the human being who comes to know God and praise God is vastly superior to any angel. The fact that you sacrificed your night to come study the Qur'an makes you better than angels. The question is, do you see it like that? We were raised to believe in angels like powerful celestial beings. They are. But better or not better is a different, there's a, a way to judge that. Now, let's ask you another question. If you're teaching religion to your kids, do this because we said and that's what you have to believe. You have to say prayers in this language and this way and do it because that's the rules. If they do it because that's why you said, what is their value? This is a big problem in teaching religion. Handing it down as culture. It's a culture. What my parents did, I do. And I don't question it. But the Qur'an challenged all people to challenge their parents. And Abraham's the big example. He didn't just go... What was normal in Abraham's society, what everybody agreed upon, his own parents, what are they agreed upon? He said, now hold on, let's think about this for a minute. So even as a Muslim, to say, now why are we doing this? Why should we do that? That's perfectly, not only acceptable, that is highly advisable. And if the Ummah would take this route, Iman would become some organic, real thing to a large degree. But right now, it's a very superficial, cultural thing to a large degree. And there's a lot of societal pressure and um, shunning and shaming into action. And like brother came to me and said, my son is saying that he is convinced that he can eat a chicken sandwich at the store. I'm trying to tell him. I said, he should respect his family's religious leanings mm -hmm. as he lives in their roof and things like that. But I'm still advising you. This is a well-established, mainstream understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah that he's taking. Please do not force upon him your understanding whenever it is just your opinion that you follow. If he's following another opinion of great scholars, why should you be threatened by it? Because it's a cultural thing. You need everything to be the way I was raised, not within the boundaries of Islam. And that's the problem. And that's why religion is often insincere. You are doing it to please others. I challenge one people to think that if they came to the mosque, I, I made the point that, you know, we saw people, I've made this point here, but it is the sunnah to pray sunnah at home. The actual way of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions was Isha would finish, Salat al-Isha would finish, everybody would go home and pray. There's absolutely no narration that would have them praying sunnah prayers in the mosque. But secularism has placed the religion in the mosque and then home is a different thing. And the Prophet warned about that. So, um, that is uh, an example of where we need to reflect. Why are we doing what we're doing and how? And what's the reasoning behind it? So we need to be praising him based upon knowledge. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا He taught Adam the names of all things. ثُمَّ عَرَضَهُمْ عَلَى الْمَلَائِكَةِ He then presented them to the angels and asked them. أَمْبِئُونِي بِأَسْمَاءِ هَأُولَاءِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Tell me the names of them if you are true in your mind. How many of you got the idea? that God taught, one by one, Adam, the names of everything. That has been presented. It sounds a little bit rigorous. It would probably take a long time. I'll tell you the understanding of this that I'm convinced with, is that God created Allama Bayan. It's the tafsir of this ayah. Humans have this natural propensity of language and attaching to things a phonetic uh, meaning, what that is. So there's 
asma and musammayat. There is what we call it and there's what it actually is, which is much more complicated. But we need to attach things and realities, we need to attach a word that would represent that. Now what's behind that and what that thing really is, 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 amazing, is deep. So but the, that, that word will be the, will be the folder. The world will be the folder of that thing. So human beings, wherever they're at, wherever they were, they, you know, developed linguistic expression. Oh, here's Sutta Rahman. So that's, we just remember what we were doing before it was supposed to be here. So when he talked about us having sophisticated expression, that's actually the means by which we are supposed to be the Khalifa. But He has made this earth for human beings. And it is our expression that is how we will properly carry the weight of justice in this world. So that's why freedom of speech is very important. Even in Islam. Like some people say things like, there's no freedom of speech in Islam. I'm like, is there? I mean, Moses was like, God, can you let me see you? Abraham was like, show me how you raise the dead. These are seemingly blasphemous things to most religious people. This is just the natural nature of human beings. We're trying to understand, and so everybody should have the right to talk about something. Now, if your point... And what you're doing by what you're saying is creating discord and turmoil. Then you're not using that expression in the way it was intended. And here you should be stopped. Because you are, and here, you know what's interesting? What I'm saying is written in Islamic legal books a long, long ago. This is literally what they've come up with in modern day America. You <coughs> cannot go into a movie theater and yell, fire. Because everybody will flip out and people will injure each other. This is not free speech. Because what you will do with it. So to say this speech or that speech, hate speech, these type of things, there should be a line drawn. A long time ago, uh, the community, the Muslim world, including all the scholars, would have removed Trump from office simply because this guy talks in a way that is completely unbecoming of any sort of reasonable person, much less a leader of anyone. But Islamic law will not allow this stuff to continue. Allah, he's, he's not a politician. We're not asking you to be a politician. We're asking you to be decent and rational and reasonable and fair. That's all. And to be honest, that's all we're asking. You have proven time and time again that you're not. But see, the way we're at it with our fake freedom of speech, which is very superficial and very much related to political interest. We've decided Republicans have an idea of free speech. If they want to oppress people, it's free speech. We're just protecting our religious right. But then when those people kneel for the national anthem, this is not a free speech. Why? Well, we've decided that that's disrespecting the thing. So... It's important. So the, the angels uh, were looking at themselves as superior than yeah. human beings. They're like, we don't kill anybody. We don't do harm to people. We just do whatever God has said and His wisdom is, is ultimate. We don't take things personally and create problems. Allah is saying, no. قَالُوا سُبْحَانَكَ لَا عِلْمَنَا لَا إِلَّا مَا عَلَّمْتَنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْحَيْحَ they responded, glory be to you. All we know is whatever you've taught us, indeed you are the omniscient and wise. Subhana, tasbih, the meaning of that is, we say glory. Glory is not doing justice to this world. It means to negate all flaws and defects and shortcomings. Subhana, you have no error and flaw. You are perfect. So when you look at something amazing and you say subhanallah, what you're saying is that thing's pretty amazing, but God is, is better than that. God is more amazing, more awesome than that. 
how should we respond when proof and evidence is presented? Prophet said, Al Kibr Batr al-Haq nas So humility is the essence. Batr al haq is you would reject the truth when it comes to you. How would you know the truth? Because you're sincerely looking for it. If you're set in your ways and you're sure about what your truth is, you will never listen to anyone about anything. You will just press on. Humility is to say, maybe I don't, and this is the best thing. If you just, as a general practice, in all things when somebody's differing with you, or telling you that there's something wrong about what you're saying or doing or whatever, if you just immediately take a look at yourself and say, maybe I'm doing wrong. Honestly, maybe, I, maybe there's, I've done something wrong. Maybe I'm not saying this right. Maybe I should have done that differently. And then, when somebody advises you, or whenever somebody is uh, proving to you what the thing is, what the situation is, then it will be easy. Somebody said to me, the Civil War was not about slavery. <clears throat> and I said, are you serious? And he said, yes, this is just some liberal thing. And I was like, okay, so I know a guy who has a master's degree in American history. Would you like to talk to him? He's a liberal. I said, no, no, he's actually a devout Muslim. You know, pretty conservative guy, actually. But on this thing, he's going to tell you what it is. And he's white. So, it's, it's going to be a hard... Oh, well, you know, you know, he's, you know, I don't know. I said, hey, let me... So I sent all these links. History.com, this and that and the other, all this and all that. A hundred different great scholars in pretty much every institution you can find. The underlying problem and theme, why there was a civil war, why it was so disastrous, was slavery. Everybody knows this. This person says to me, that's their opinion. And I was like, it's not a matter of opinion. It's what happened. Everybody knows that. This person is set in their way. Why? Because they like to watch one channel. And whatever they're telling on that channel, they believe is true patriotic stuff. When you're doing a news channel and you keep putting waving flags in the background that all the colors are always red, white, and blue, and you're this older person who feels like your country is becoming something different and new, you're being very powerfully brainwashed to be a soldier for whatever that true American revival of what always was, you know, make America great again. That's like the idea. Make it like it used to be when we were younger. It's changed because of all these immigrants. So, it's a very sophisticated uh, process that they've used. So arrogance and foolishness is unbecoming of a human being. So the angels, they know that's not how it is. We learn in this one, the unseen is only known by God. <clears throat> it's not our business to decide what is the unseen, and we should not claim that we know how things are. To understand the intentions and ultimate realities, it just doesn't make sense. What's really going on, I don't know how many people have had this conversation, what they really mean, what they're really doing behind the scenes, you don't know. I'm like, how do you know? Well, I can see some evidence of it. The angels are like, the evidence we see is this. So therefore, their whole reality should be this. No, no, hold on. Allah is saying, no, that's not what it is. I know something you don't know. So we go for the unseen to God. Who says, لا يحيطون بشيء من علمي. It means people do not know of knowledge except for what God allows you to know. So what you have come to know is a limited reality. So that goes back to the whole thing. When somebody's like, well, I don't know, it just seems harsh to me why if somebody in a Muslim country stole all this, that they would chop off the person's head. This seems like cruel and unusual punishment to me. I said, you know why you think that? Because you were born and raised in the United States, and people collectively decided that for you. And so you were born thinking that. This is not some great truth you've deeply researched the matter as an objective person who's studying laws and its effects and what happens if this happens and what punishments could do what and so forth. You're just saying whatever culture has made you say. You're not your own person here. You're fashioned to be this way. Now that somebody would say to us, you're just following your religion blindly. You're looking at it as my religion, I'm looking at it as a revelation that came to a miraculous prophet. I'm trusting that. So I'll go ahead and follow that. So whatever it is, you're not necessarily knowing the great wisdom to it, and you are surely biased, um, even if you come from a Muslim country. 
So <clears throat> I've met I've met Muslim men from Muslim countries that think they can beat their wife. Can beat your wife. Why? I just believe the Quran is telling me that. I said, did you study the meanings of those words and the scholarly interpretation and the hadith of the Prophet as commenting on those ayahs? If you did, you would know no scholar, nobody, the Prophet never taught that, nobody condoned that in the history of Islam. And you're just cherry picking to something that you think makes sense to you. That you want to, you have your desires and so forth. So he's saying that he has the wisdom behind creating things that seem bad. People seem bad. Because we do a lot of bad things. But when we choose to do good, that is the most valuable thing in existence. The most precious part of all of creation is a human mind and heart coming together and choosing to reject its own personal ego and desire in order to serve that which gave it its existence. That is the single most precedence and beauty and greatness in all of creation. It is the most beautiful thing that exists. And God has said, whoever would do those things and recognize that they have all these other flaws over here, but they're trying their best to do this and that's their purpose in life. He's saying, I will show you eternal bliss. Would we know what eternal bliss is if we have never been sick, had sadness, felt lost, been afflicted, been hurt? If you've never been through any of that, what would bliss mean? It would mean nothing to you. So how could you be gifted with bliss? How could you earn it? How could you appreciate it? How could you know what it is? So that's what we're all doing here. So optimism over pessimism. That's it. That's the, that's, the, that's the essence of this whole series of verses. Oh, look, they've killed people. And they're doing this and that. They're all just terrible. What was that? Uh, Eeyore? You guys know about Eeyore? From Winnie the Pooh, man. Come on. Man. Come on, Asa. You know what Eeyore. Everything. <laughs> so we gotta be positive. We gotta be like Mickey Mouse. Always positive. Everything's good and happy and fine. Everything. We have guys. There's always a solution. There are always bright pastures ahead of us with light at the end of the tunnel. No problem. We can solve all of this. It's the magic of Disney. <laughs> so we have to be optimistic. We have to look for the good in each other, in ourselves in the world around us, not allow the negative thing to hold us down and to keep us in a negative state. Because negativity breeds negativity. Misery loves company. It's what's wrong with the world. Turn on the news! Yeah! I'm gonna throw up. So this is uh, the story here. There's something very special. It's whenever a human being will choose to do godly things, to be selfless, compassionate, caring, creative, contributing, concerned about the well-being of everyone, giving, charitable, honest, genuine, kind, gentle, loving, compassionate, all of those qualities that is God, just, fair, all of that. So if we can do that, then we'll be the we'll have the caliphate. So what is a caliphate? It's not a government. It's not like the Islamic government system. There's not. It's just, if a Muslim country decided, okay, this person is the ruler, if that ruler is chosen because they have moral and governmental knowledge that needs to be had, their morality, who they are as a person, what they've learned about what they're going to have to be doing as a, as a ruler, if all that was chosen because people have all witnessed, particularly the elders that know this person for a long time, and all that, people witness it. So that person becomes the leader. And then you have other leaders that are appointed, either by him or by other people, and they all work together for these causes. It will be a caliphate. It doesn't have to be like, <clears throat> okay, this guy has ultimate authority, and he's like, you know, has to grow a long beard and stuff. Yeah, good. 
Mm. This process of esteem and this technology, how, how has it changed from this great spiritual and practical daily struggle with our, our everyday attitudes and behavior to this very complicated political and military concept? I mean, was that it really happened uh, whenever Muawiyah made the decision عنه, to give the rule to Yazid. And this is the downfall of the Ummah. Um, now, I just have to say truth is truth is truth, and it's not like I'm, I'm, I'm bringing problems for myself even though people perceive it that way. When Uthman was allowing some of his cousins to rule places and they were not. He did that out of good suspicion and when he found out there were flaws, he would bring them in and remove them from their post and even sometimes they got latched. But that started the, that, and that's, you know, you know, we have stories in our history books about why he got assassinated. But that's probably the main reason, you know. And so, so he was too a spiritual of a guy. This is what happens when the guy is just really holy and spiritual and reads lots of Qur'an, prays and fasts all day and all night and all that. And he doesn't know anything about managing a society. So that's where that happened. Now Ali was that, well, Ali was that two-pronged guy. But now there's this whole problem. And there's people who thought he should have always been there and this and that. And this now that was it. So Hassan, after that, did the right thing whenever he said, I'm going to give it to Muawiyah. That was huge. That was Khilafah. <clears throat> See, some people in our own books, or obviously the Shia tradition would say, that that was, he, you know, it didn't happen or it shouldn't have happened. But Hassan said, look, the military all have their allegiance and Muawiyah has sophisticated governmental control over these people. And he's a pious Muslim. He was. Muawiyah was a pious Muslim, memorized the whole Quran, and he was one of those who the Prophet Sallallahu advised to write the whole Quran down. So, but then he's coming out on his death. We don't really know exactly how or why he came to this conclusion because it was his written, and, but it was confirmed that he one said it and wrote it. Now he's giving it to Yazid and he felt like that's in the Muslim. That was the biggest mistake in the history of Islam. Because once Yazid did, it was all about myself and my power and my family and my tribe and, you know, palaces got built and all of these things and became a whole different narration. So they're calling that a caliphate. The reason why they call it a caliphate, the uh, Khilaf al Umawiyya or Dawla al Umawiyya, I think Dawla is a more fair thing. Uh, but they're saying that the, the social law and structure and construct was still functioning on a scriptural basis to the large part, very large part. It was not normal for things against the Islamic law to happen. That was not normal all the way through there. Um, and then when the Abbasiyin came in, they started out good, <clears throat> but then slowly they got um, they got even worse than than I mean. In the end of the Abbasi period, man, alcohol was very normal to be drunk everywhere, <coughs> and terrible things, things that with the age group we have in here we can't say and stuff like that. So. That's where the Turks came in and said, hold on guys, we respect, you know, the fact that you guys came from the family of the Prophet or whatever, but we're removing you from power because you've lost your moral veracity. People don't trust you anymore, and they trust us. It's called the Seljuk Turks. They started this transition to Persian Turks, these people. they did Because they were very structured and, and organized and moral, and they prayed and they were serious. At the same time, they understood international relations and social realities and injustices, and they were out there trying to fix it um, when nobody else cared. So that all came after a couple of centuries. That all started to go downhill because they went back to the same thing: the tribal, the power, the control, the subjugation of others to their will, and then follow. And going back to David, they weren't judging with truth and justice, and they were not. They were not rejecting personal desires. So it was no longer a caliphate, even though they call the Ottoman Empire a caliphate. 
The people say, the downfall of the Ottoman Empire was 1924. No, that happened a long time ago. 300 years before that, 400 years before that was the downfall of any caliphate. But people don't look at it like that because they want to see it as a political system. They had control that they were Muslim, they were taking zakat from the corners of the earth and all that. Okay, that's a formality, it's a superficial thing. We need to define it as it was. In our history, there's literally a couple hundred years of a caliphate. A real caliphate. And Spain, mashallah, it actually by itself, maybe six centuries, this caliphate. But that was something very unique to Spain. Spain is the best example of a flourishing caliphate which is growing intellectually and spiritually and the inclusion and the interaction of Muslims and non-Muslims and all of that was very solid, very part and sunnah based. Freedoms and justice and liberty and all of those things was mainstay. And that's what really bothered why the Spanish Inquisition came. They said, man, people are just choosing to go over there and live with them. Like they're not even fighting wars anymore to build their empire. People are just going and moving there from all over Europe and Italy because of their civilization. And they were like, okay, come in here and we'll convert you. They were, they were converted to the society, not necessarily to the religion. And that's the way the religion should present itself. We have different angles of contribution we'd like you to appreciate. Come check it out. And if you want to follow that, you can follow that. If you want to follow that, you can follow that. Don't cause corruption and justice and oppression in the society. Otherwise, the letter of the law will come. Other than like the spirit of the law is vibrant and interactive with everyone. Play inshallah, any other question? There is a contrast at the end of the ayah. They are contrasting themselves to the to us, to the people. I'm not sure if they are reading anything out of that contrast. The angels are making. Yeah, yeah, they're saying we're better than people. We just, uh, we are just holy, righteous entities. Well, God is saying, you do that because I have made you that way. You're not choosing to do that. Yeah, my point is that, are they saying, for example, we are sufficient, you don't need those people anymore? Or no, 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 yeah, no, this is, yeah. no, I got you. No, no, what we would understand from, just from our understanding of a malaika and their reality, they're trying to understand why. They're just simply asking a question why. So... Yeah, I get your point. You're saying, well, it seems like they're saying, we're doing the right thing, we're here doing it, so why do we got to bring these people, you know, we can, we can do whatever it is we want in the earth. So the, the underlying theme here is that God knows and appreciates something that will come from human beings that no angel could ever represent. They could never be that. That's just not what they are. And so the human being, when they choose this path, it completely negates all the bad that they do. And that's the concept of Inaba and Toba. Is that when you keep turning to Him, then when you return to Him, you will be pure and clean of all of those flaws that you've done. It will not ever be a flaw. Because the fact that you recognize it as a flaw, and you know who is the one that does not have flaws, and you're asking Him to remove it, He's saying, I'll remove it. But that whole process takes a level of humility, gratitude, submission, that is the most precious thing. Because it's realizing the ultimate truth, even though I have the right to be separate from it. This is where kufr is not necessarily like, well, I'm just born into a non-Muslim family. No, kufr is coming to know it. Kafir wa kaddabu bi ayatina. You come to know about the ayat. Ayat are not just verses of the Quran, it's all the signs of God. In yourself, wa fi anfuzim wa fil afaqi and all of that. Ayat, they're all around you, inside you, around you. You see it, you feel it, the presence of God. The signs, the miracles of God, it's all there. So when you suppress all of that, and then you see revelation, you see a prophet, you think about it, it's already built in all these laws. Like right now, people thought deeply about what's wrong with Europe and all of that, and they came up with the American model. And of course, part of that was guided by Islam, because Thomas Jefferson had the translation of the part N that he has his notes in. You can go look at it. Keith Ellison did his swearing. He said, there's notes in there. I looked in it. He made notes to himself. And so what? This guy's figure... And if you think about some of the things he stood for, he was a deist, you know. He was not part, partial to religion. He thought it was foolish and corny to believe God is Jesus and that the Bible is the Word of God. That was Thomas Jefferson. And these things are mentioned that way in the Quran, by the way. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so yeah, so they formed this enlightened state. You know, like there was this guy, I don't know if I said it to this group, 
There was this guy uh, from a Somali background. He he's, was in the Boston area studying. Uh, he's, he's got his law degree and he's, I guess, starting his career. So he came to this institute uh, thing that I was giving a seminar at. And uh, he was asking questions about Islamic legal principles and stuff. And there's all these principles that we have that predate European enlightenment by hundreds of years. Everybody was medieval over there. They were chopping heads off and you know, taking women and using that with crosses on and all that. All kind of terrible things. Just ISIS stuff was going on for hundreds of years in Europe. And they were all Christians and Jesus loved them and he died for their sins. So he was like, you're telling me that Muslims have had these legal principles and these understandings of the process of legal valuation and how you should judge and all. I said, yeah, it's always been there. You, you can look. I have books in my house that were written. If you look on it, who the guy who wrote it, he, he died in the year uh, 900 Common Era. You know, so long before anything, 1100 Common Era, things like that, you have these books we have now. He was like, man, the guy had become agnostic. He admitted to me in private. He said, actually, you know, my family is very upset with me. I've become agnostic because I thought, and here's the problem. The way religion was taught to him was by force. These are the rules, this is what you have to do. If you don't, you go to hellfire. You know, those are the Americans, and this is the way they think, and all this confused cultural garble of stuff. And the, the essence of the pure Islamic understanding of things was, was not presented. So, of course, he doesn't want to follow it. And whenever he grew up, and now he's become a, he's now as uh, intellectual from the college. He's uh, openly said, I don't have anything to do with your religion. And now they've rejected him. Now he's saying, do I have to take a... He's, he's asking me, should I take a shahada? And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, well, because now I think I believe that Islam is from God. And it's because he's learning about things that America holds as we invented them. These are ideas and concepts we created for the world to have justice and truth and freedom and liberty and all that. And they were there a long time ago in Islamic books, way long before anybody in Europe had any idea about these things. And if you study history, you'll find that Europeans used to go and study in Arabic the Islamic sciences and philosophy and culture and style, and they would bring it back. And just like what we did with the Greek stuff, we learned it all, we expounded upon it, and then we started, you know. So that's basically, uh, alhamdulillah, you know, our khilafah will come back whenever, as a Muslim community, as a society. It's not a matter of uh, violent force and all of that. <clears throat> See, you know, that's like, you know, this is where we're at. We've been hundreds of years detached from a real functioning caliphate. And so, in, you have to understand Arab culture and history, even in world history. When you think about the Roman Empire, you think about the Colosseum and, the, and all these wars, gladiator and stuff. Right? Yeah. Gladiator is the most awesome movie. What's it about? All those Romans. Were there. And was there any good stuff about Rome? Yeah, of course there was, probably. You know, we don't get to hear about that because it's not like it doesn't sell tickets. You know, so uh, they look back and they read, the, you know, the life of the Prophet Ghazabat al Rasul. Like, you'll be reading the seerah of the Prophet, so some of you be like, man, this is a bunch of wars. Is that because his whole life was wars? Or is that because the perspective of the people who wrote about him was in that thinking of Amjad, Shaja'a, Wal Harb, Wal Firasa, and all of that? That's how they thought. That was their ancient culture. But if you actually, I, I Marshal Tarak Swayden did this, and he made this presentation to a conference I was at in Kuwait. He said, I've now looked at the whole extent of the actual battles that took place. And the 23 years of the prophethood, you're talking about if you say all the battles, how long each one of them took, you could put them in a year. Yet the way we read the biographies is like 75% of everything was a war. And you have to learn the lessons from the war and how they did and how Allah made signs and all that. That's why it's very important for us to read through Bukhari and Muslim Tirmidhi, Muslim Ahmed and all that. Because you'll start to see all these other things. I'll give you a great example. Abdul Halim Abu Shukta. You know, I'm just going to let all this off, off myself. He was raised in Jordan and went to Saudi Arabia. He was a Hadith scholar. He studied with Ibaz, al Bani, all those guys. MashaAllah. And so he decided one time, he said, I'm going to make a seerah that's very authentic, and it's just according to the most authentic hadith. So instead of using Ibn Hisham and Ishaq, which is the historical umda, what they call it, 
two volume, which was done a hundred and some years after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life, that tells the story in a certain way. Everybody usually takes from that and expounds upon it. He said, I'm just going to put that aside. I'm going to go start with Bukhari. And the Muslim, I'm just going to go through anything that happened in the life of the Prophet. I'm going to try to contextually put it in chronological order. That's what he said. He said, this is a, this is a new creative idea I have. So he's going through Bukhari. He's not even, you know, a quarter of the way through Bukhari. And he has all these things about women. Interactions between men and women. Things about women. Things about the Prophet's relationship with his wives, his daughters, the women in society and how they interacted and all that. He said, the heck is this? What's going on here? He came to this epiphany and conclusion that these are all authentic hadith of the highest proportion and they seem to conflict with everything I've ever taught about women and how many women interact. So he went to one of his sheikhs and the sheikh explained to him Sadda Dhariya. Sadda Dhariya is a uh, legal principle that some scholars suggested, some did not like it. But some scholars said, even something we know is taught by Islam, and most praiseworthy by the part of the Sunnah. If we feel like we've seen the evidence that that action that the Prophet did and the, the Quran approved of is leading to bad things, we're going to chop it off. We're going to cancel that and make a rule that that's haram. And therefore, we're blocking the means to the way to evil. So, Sheikh Abdul Halim was like, Yeah, but what about? Uh, okay, yeah, but that's... So, when it came to oppressing women and compartmentalizing them and making them the source of all the problems and making them superior, um, they're big fuqaha and mujtahideen with deep principles. When it comes to anything else, it's like literal. We have to be very literal about everything else other than that. It has to do with women or appreciating things in the West and cultural diversity and growth. The things that are in the Quran and the Sunnah that are literal, we have to interpret them in a different way because now if we fall into that, you know. So he wrote this book called Tahrir al-Mar'a fi Asr Risala. It's six volumes long. It uh, amounts to some 3,000 pages. And it's basically everything in the Hadith and the Quran and the Tafsir that has to do with women. And he called it liberation of women in the time of the Prophet. And so... Uh, this great scholar, who's known to be Salaf, he's a big Hadith scholar. They shunned him, rejected him, and they named him. Many Saudi scholars call him Al Halik, the one who is destroyed, the destroyed man, because he wrote this six-volume book, quoting all these things and using commentaries that existed and adding some of his own because. He thinks it's culturally relevant for people who live in today. Which is what scholars have always been doing. But how dare you challenge our ways, right? So this is not khilafah. This is a control and twisting the religion for desires. This is that right? So that's why the God told David, don't just follow desires. Judge with truth and justice. Be blind. Don't allow the... So in the Muslim world, just like here, People are saying this about religion because their cultural construct has told them that's the way you must think and say about things and do. They're doing it in the Muslim world too. You know how many people, if you ask them, is there something called an honor killing? I've asked many. So I have one brother stood up and valiantly said what an honor killing was. I was like, are you aware that has nothing to do with Islam? And every single school of thought says that's murder and you will go to hell. The brother was like, that's not what we were told. That's not how we were raised. And I said, and what made the way you were raised of divine revelation? Right? That's what the Quran said like that. Yeah. Yes. So, you agree that the concept of Khilafah is not... Uh, it's not a specific a set political system. Structure. If you, if you activate in your daily life, you're part of the Khilafah. You are doing it in your home and in yourself. This is it. This is Khilafah. To stand up for justice and all of that, to go out and, and promote what's right, to forbid what's wrong. That's all the Khilafah. In a Muslim country, it would mean that the one who is has a charge or the people who make the laws, that they are deriving that from the religious code. And that doesn't mean God has an exact answer to everything that happens in society. 
there will be a human ijtihad on a large array of things, uh, but you just can't conflict with a very clear teaching uh, on that. So as long as you're deriving it like that, and that's what's crazy about the whole Morsi presidency. That's all he suggested. He said, and from now on, we need to have a committee of Azhar Fuqaha to approve of what laws we have and to future be a uh, uh, shura in the Majlis Shaab or whatever they're called over there, Majlis, whatever they call it, the parliament, the, that's how Islamic law should be involved. It was spread around the world, NPR and even the liberal things. They want Sharia law to take over and oppress women. This is how I heard it on NPR myself. Muhammad Morsi has called for Sharia law to dominate the country and for women to be oppressed. And I went, hold on, let me go back and see. And I went to the Arabic of what he suggested. Nothing of the sort in his constitution. That, that actually the whole parliament that was voted in there. Obviously. And then these, Judy, these judges said, we're canceling all that because look, the whole world doesn't like it. And we live in a world where we have to be part of everything. And it's, it's, it's oppression and all this. What? They told everybody in the media and everywhere this was going on. That's not what was going on. It was just saying that we've allowed human uh, thought process gu guided by people in France and England and America to decide for us how our morals and how we should be. And then we also adopt all of their corrupt practices as well. And we're not very good at hiding it or doing it in a way that we can get away with it like they are. Right? And so why don't we just say Islam? Right? So... Anyway, inshallah may Allah guide us all to what is right and make us all full of that and the ard and make us those that are truly uh, reflective and representing of that which was revealed to us inshallah.